Thank you. Maybe may be seated. So glad that each of you are here this morning for all of our guests that are here with graduates this morning. We are delighted you are here. Nine graduates, that's the most we've had in a very, a very long time. We're excited and proud of each of you, uh, moms and dads, and what a, an incredible accomplishment that each of you have arrived. It sounds like we're going to be good. If we hurt ourselves, we've got a physical therapist. We're going to have nurses to take care of us. If our dogs get sick, we're good there. We've got some business folks to help take care of us. This class is going to take care of us. We're good to go as they embark on this journey. If you have a copy of God's Word, would you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6? Deuteronomy chapter 6. If you are a guest this morning, you're jumping in on the tail end of a series. So my apologies for that, but it's important. We've been carrying it through from last week to this week. And to be honest with you, we may not get through with it today. It is so important. These, all these six motives are important as part of what we call our vision frame. You just get a real sneak peek of the, the DNA, the iron, the, the, the framing of what makes Pedal First Baptist, Pedal First Baptist. And if you don't have a church home, we'd love for you to uh, come back and come again another Sunday to see what God is doing here, which is part of our mission. Part of this vision frame talks about these four M words around this, this square, around this frame, if you will. The first one is our mission to engage people with the hope of the gospel, to see lives transformed. That is our mission here. It's on the front page of your outline if you have it there. That is our mission. Our, our, our motives we've talked about over these last several weeks together, they're on your outline there. Where those six motives are relationship over isolation. A key one there, motive, uh, life transformation over more information, biblical truth over my opinion, uh, investing over consuming, going over staying, and then this last one, strong families over busy calendars. Those are our motives. Those are our values. What do we value the most? What do we find the most important? There are a lot of things we can major on, but we want to make sure we major on these six things. Then the bottom part of that, that frame you have there is our map. It, it is our, how we know what we're doing. It's how do we know to, how to get from point A to point B? How do we know what a completely devoted follower of Jesus Christ looks like? Then we find it there in connect, grow, commit, and go. That's the process. That's the journey we want every person to take in being a part of Pedal First Baptist Church. And so are you being connected to the gospel and, and to a church? Are you growing in your faith? Are you being committed, committing your time and your resources and your energy towards seeing others come to know Christ? And are you going to the ends of the earth to everyone everywhere to share the gospel? Again, our life group talked about in the journey this morning about the, the, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And so are we heeding that call from Christ to go to the ends of the earth? That's that picture. And then lastly, our, our, um, our measures. How do we know if we're being successful not in the world's eyes, but in God's eyes. And so we encourage everyone to ask these six questions of themselves and of their family. And how am I living authentically, biblically, connectedly, desperately, evangelistically, and faithfully? Those six key things really help us give a real measure to where we are and are we really being all that God has called us to be. So that's kind of our overall vision frame. We come back to this motive of strong families over busy calendars. We dove into Deuteronomy chapter 6 last week. And this, this idea of strong families over busy calendars is talked about this way. That we will equip parents to lead their families to prioritize Christ rather than conforming to the expectations of our culture. We talked about last Sunday that the pressure, the pressure of our culture to do certain things, to live a certain way, to spend our money a certain way. That we talked about it when we talked about investing over consuming, that, that our culture is designed to push us in certain directions. And yet, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to not be conformed to this world, to the pattern of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we may pray with the will of God, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2 tell us. The world wants to press us into its mold, and yet our call is to, to not be willing to be pressed into that mold, but to be different, to be transformed. Now, when we say to be conformed to the culture, it doesn't mean that there'll be pieces of our lives that are like the culture, because we're a part of culture, Right? But the idea is that that culture does not dictate nor control how we raise our kids, how we live our lives, how we do our jobs. We allow the culture of who we are as Jesus Christ's followers that would dictate that. But in particular in the family, we will talk about these things. We talk about the fact what they're demonstrated by. A commitment to help strengthen and serve families, to help build and maintain strong biblical marriages, to equip parents with the tools necessary to raise their children in an increasingly secular culture, to know and to follow Christ, to have excellent and engaging ministries, age group ministries from birth all the way through college, to use, and we'll talk a little about this more this morning, the orange strategy to help families and the church partner together, not one or the other, but together to deeply impact the next generation. And then also not overcrowding our church calendar, making it family friendly. 
That's one reason we don't have Sunday night church. We want to give time for families. We want to give time for fellowships. We want to give time for people to connect. Everybody tells us all the time, I'm so busy. My calendar is so crammed. So we've made a commitment to not cram our calendar full. We want to give opportunities for people to breathe, for people to have opportunities to make investments in the lives of their neighbors and their coworkers and their classmates and their friends. So we try to be careful. So we talk about these values from a corporate level, from a church stance, right? But then we kind of hone it down to what does it mean for us? What does it mean for us as parents, as grandparents, as aunts, uncles, and cousins, and single folks, and college students? What does it mean for us to flesh out this value? Well, I mentioned to you last week, we talked about this idea that, that, that for a family that comes to our church family, for those of you who invest in birth through college, that we have on average, right, on average about 60 maybe plus hours a year with these students and children and preschoolers. That sounds like a lot, doesn't it? But in the reality, it's not a whole lot. It's important. It's valuable. It's critical time. We have 52 Sundays a year. There's some Wednesday nights. So I, I gave 40 Sundays a year for the average for everybody. And then I threw in about an extra 20 plus for Wednesday nights that you might be here. About 60. It's not a lot, is it? Right? Sorry, just got to eat a and then they're just killing me right there. So, um, so that's, uh, that's those 60 hours. Now, moms and dads, guess what? You have 3,000 hours a year. 3,000 hours a year. You can see. You can see the difference, right? I covered these because some said there were little var varmints and vultures that, that descended on my M&Ms last week. I won't name any names down here on the front rows. Down here. And uh, so... Because I need, I need to be able to use this. M&Ms are not cheap, by the way, just in case you didn't know. So, um, so you see the difference, right? This is huge. And so we, we as a church family have to spend more time helping to equip, encourage, and engage moms and dads, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, and single folks to understand that we have a huge opportunity to impact families. But I'm not sure we've caught every moment possible because here as church folks, pastors at the top of the list, we focus a whole lot on this because this is what you pay us to do, by the way, right? Is to do these hours right here. Plus, I can add a few more hours for staff to hospitals and other things we have to do alongside that. So this is our primary focus, it would seem. But what I want to encourage and challenge our staff to do, and we're talking about this on a daily basis, is that how can we equip families how can we encourage families? Not, we're not, I'm not here to give you a guilt trip and say, good night, you're doing a terrible job and you need to do better. We all know we can do better. You don't need anybody to tell you that. We all want to do better. So I'm not here to do that. I want to encourage you. I want to tell you it is possible. I want to put some tools and resources in your hands to help us partner together with intentionality from birth all the way at least through 18 years old. Even though our college ministry has great value of helping invest in the lives of children and of students. So you see the difference, the discrepancy, it's there, right? We understand that parents want to know how to do these things. And so we're going to talk about those even this morning. But I want us to think about this for a moment. We want to use that strategy. But here's, the, here's the, the thrust of the scripture this morning. We're called to leave a legacy. You and I as moms and dads, as grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, and single folks, we include all of you, we're all called to leave a legacy. My son, Show Choir, sang a song this year, which I just loved. It's called Leave a Legacy by Nicole Norderman. It's a great song. And it just talks about leaving a legacy. What kind of legacy are we going to leave behind? What will be said about this church 50 years from now? Now, seniors, let me, let me just, let me, let me hurt your feelings for a minute. Um, you're going to walk across that stage. You know what's going to happen in August, seniors? This is going to really hurt your feelings now. Are you ready? They're going to forget you. No, they won't. I'm going to come back as a freshman and come to high school and say, oh, we love you. And they will that one time. But you know what? They ain't thought about you all the rest of the year. So as I graduated 20 years ago, you go back to your school and you have to look for that picture. And people, all they do are those pictures, by the way, is just make fun of how you look 20 years ago. That's all they do. Look at that hair. Good night. Look at that. Look at that. Look at this, right? My goodness, right? We, we want to think that we, we're going to leave this great legacy behind, right? But the reality is the legacy we leave is not found in a picture the legacy is what we leave behind to our children and to those who know us. But specifically, this incredible call by the Lord that Moses gives to the nation of Israel here. In a real critical moment in the nation of Israel's history, their past and their future is about to collide. They've come out of the, the exile. They've been in the wilderness for 40 years, right? They're about to give the promised land. This is an incredible opportunity. So Moses is going to marry these two together and give them one of the most powerful scriptures. The Jews call it the Shema. 
You know it already. You know, might not know that's the word of it. That's what it's called, the Shema. It's to love you, Lord your God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus shares that and adds that part of strength to it. It's critical. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let's look beginning in verse number 1. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you. That you might do them in the land where you're going over to possess it. So that you and your sons and your grandsons might fear the Lord your God. To keep his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life. And that your days may be prolonged O Israel. You should listen and be careful to do it that it may be well with you. And that you may multiply greatly just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. So stop right there. The first five verses, obey the commands, do what God has called you to do. Now he's going to give the why. And this is critical, parents. I don't want you to miss this. We want our kids to be obedient, to be moral, to make the right choices. But we have to tell them the why. Because if all they get is to be moral and right and nice... All you end up is with empty religion. Here's the why. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, right? With all your soul, with all your mind. And these words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your sons and daughters. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way. And when you lie down. And when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. And on they shall be as frontals on your forehead. And you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. What does that mean, all that stuff, right? Well, the Jews, they would carry this thing on the front of their head. that had scripture in front of it. They would have them on their wrists, right? It was on the doorpost. You know what that means? That God was to be what? Everywhere in everything that they did. Not just compartmentalize that this is church and this is God. And we did it on Sundays at 9.30 or 9 or 10 or 10.30. And then Mondays through Friday and Saturdays, we do our other part. We might throw a little God in on Wednesday night that is compartmentalized. But the reality is what Moses was telling the Jews is this. Is that God is to be a part of every part of our lives. Not just a small part. But to have a deep, profound effect on every part of who we are. Up to this point, Moses has given them commandments. The Ten Commandments. They are to do these things. And now all of a sudden, he kind of flips gears. And he says, this is why I want you to do these things. It's because of a relationship. A relationship I want you to have with a living God who loves you, who cares for you, who has proven to you that he is trustworthy, that he will do exactly what he said he would do. Even when we don't do what we're supposed to do, God does it anyway. And he proves that in a relationship he wants us to be in. So he gives them the plan to to guard their heritage, to transfer their faith to the next generation. And by the way, he wasn't just talking to moms and dads. He was talking to the entire nation. All of us have this responsibility. Now, when I say that, all I can hear in my mind is decades ago, there was this movement from the far left that it takes a village to raise kids. I can still hear that phrase in my mind. It makes me want to, it feels so creepy when I hear it. I'm like, no, it doesn't. It's not a village. You know what they're taking? They're, They're robbing a spiritual story. Really, they're robbing this of Moses. You know what? They're right. Here's what it takes. A church family. To raise a child. Not a village. Now, does it take teachers and other people? Yeah, it takes all kind of community folks to make it a reality. I get that. I understand that. But the reality is what Moses is saying here is it takes mom and dad first and foremost. Priority number one. They are the first line. And then everybody else comes alongside to support them, to undergird them, to encourage them, to help them. In this process, this arduous process, this thing that you seniors, when you were born, you did not come with an instruction manual. Boy, it would have been great, moms and dads, if you'd have had an instruction manual, wouldn't it? When they turn six, turn to page 22 and do this, right? When they ask this question, turn to page 44 and it says, ask your mother, right? You know what I'm talking about. You don't come with instruction manuals, right? In an emergency, hit the eject button. We wish we could find that in the instruction manuals. But here's the reality, man. If we had one, we wouldn't read it anyway, Right? We're called to leave, a few of you would, I heard that, some man, that was good, Chris, is that Chris Robinson who said that, who said that, down here, you said yes, that's good, I like that, very good, you like to read manuals, I'm going to come find you, I need to put something together, that's perfect, because I don't like it, here's the thing, what kind of legacy are we going to leave, so Moses is telling him, I'm going to leave this legacy, 
right? You got to pass it on from one generation to the next. Here's the problem. He says later in chapter 6, he says in verse 20, be careful to teach your kid these commandments. When your kids ask you, why, why do we have these commandments? Be careful to observe them lest you forget. We notice in Moses' words, it fast forwards to Joshua. We fast forward past Joshua. They're into the promised land. They've conquered some of the promised land. And we jump to the book of Judges next. And we see just a few generations later that the Bible says there grew up a generation who did not know the Lord nor his ways. Thus, they did what was right in their own eyes. If you've ever wondered if there's a book of the Bible that would dictate or not dictate, but would demonstrate and show where we are as a culture, you would find it in the book of Judges. Because you could have gone back several generations ago where people knew who the Lord was and knew about his ways, but that is no longer the truth. And before we go pointing our fingers at other people, let us not forget ourselves that have we passed down the faith from generation to generation. And I don't mean that we pass down rules and and laws and regulations because that makes people seem to buckle underneath the weight of that. I don't like that. I want to I want to cast that off. Have we instead not shown them that, but shown them that Christianity is a relationship with the living, loving God? There's a difference. Now, in that relationship, there are rules and there are ways to live and priorities, and there's ways to work that are designed for our benefit, for our good. So here's the question. Are you leaving a legacy behind? I pray that we would break the cycle that is in our culture today. That we have students, generations that have come up that don't know the Lord. Or if they know him, he's the good man upstairs. He's the guy who can get you out of a jam. He's the guy when the nation is in crisis that we all go, oh, all of a sudden I'm super religious. And I want to go in the front steps of the Capitol and sing God bless America. And all of a sudden it's going to be better. That's what we think of God. We think of him as, the, as a candy maker, as, a, as Santa Claus. As somebody who's just going to distribute and hand us all this stuff. A bank teller, right? That's how our culture treats God. Why? Because they don't have a relationship with him. When we have that relationship, it's different, isn't it? So moms and dads, we're leaving a legacy. How do we leave a legacy? Just quickly. I'm not going to have to, man, I'm going to see how we get it. Here's six truths. Number one, you have to consider the end. On your outline there, consider the end. Now, I find this to be true. Maybe you have not, but I have found this to be true. This is hard to do in our culture. Because our culture presses us for one thing. What is it? Is it for the end in mind down the road or what is it for more than likely? It's for the right here and the now, the right now. How do I know that? When I go to McDonald's or Wendy's, and Wendy's in particular, they got a little clock. It's timing. If it's a good day and I drive through Wendy's, I'm happy. And it's two minutes and 22 seconds. On the days I see eight or nine minutes up there, I'm like smoke coming out my ears. I didn't come to, I could have gone and dined in and eaten for 10 minutes. I just wanted to get it to go in two and a half minutes. Our culture is an instant gratification culture. I want it right now, my way, right away. With no or little consideration to what happens at the end. I want my kids to be happy now. I want my kids to be accepted. I want my kids to have this or have that or go here or do that. I want my kids to not be on the outside looking in. So I've got to do this and I've got to do this and I've got to do this and I've got to do this. With no foresight, no foresight into what is at the end of the road. Because here's the deal at the end of the road to consider. Here's at the end of the road. The ultimate of the road is eternity. We get so myopic in our vision. It's so right in front of us. All we can see is right here. And the call, if we're going to leave a legacy, moms and dads, grandparents, is we have to consider the end. See, Moses wanted to know the end goal. It was to know and love the Lord more than anything else. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what our kids know if they don't know what really matters. Here's the statement. It says this, when it comes to battling for the heart... What is temporary has a way of crowding out the eternal. 
Let me say the statement again. Reggie Joyner makes this statement. When it comes to battling for the heart, what is temporary has a way of crowding out the eternal. What was Moses saying? You've got to stay focused. Don't forget who your God really is. Now listen, Moses wasn't concerned about the nation of Israel becoming atheist. Right? He wasn't worried about them going in and rejecting God completely and becoming an outright agnostic or atheist. What he was concerned about, what he was warning them about, and what I would warn and challenge each of us, is he was saying there's a risk of you losing your focus and shifting your priorities to what in the end will not matter. Just move one time or two times and find out what really matters. What am I talking about? How many of you have an addict? Raise your hand. Have an addict. You got stuff in it. How many of you have an addict? You got too much stuff in it. Raise your hand. Keep them up. All right. How many? Let's just keep your hands. How many of you have a st- an addict and a storage unit on top of that? Raise your hand. You got a storage unit. Okay. All right. Good. We got stuff, don't we? Right. And in some of that stuff, my mom, no lie, my mom was a hoarder. Right. Like you, some of you moms are. She kept every single thing that we came home from church with, from school with, that awesome what we call back then Manila paper. Okay. Y'all know what I'm talking about, moms and dads. If you're with me, y'all have no idea what little paper is. It's okay. It's this paper, and it's kind of cream-colored, and it was really, really, like, gritty. And you did all of your artwork on it when you were in kindergarten all the way through, right? Manila paper, right? My mom had saved it in the attic for 40 years, and she decided that she needed to clean out her house before she died so we didn't have to. And I told her, I said, Mom, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but when you die, we're going to burn all this stuff. She gave me this box and had my stuff and these precious possessions. And so I go to get, this is no lie. This was so, it was like one of those moments like your mouth goes wide open, you know, and thanking God I'm almost around. I go to pick up this precious picture, right? And I pick it up and I'm not kidding you, it crumbles into pieces. This manila paper, my beautiful Van Gogh from kindergarten at five years old, crumbles into a million pieces. And I look at the rest of it and I think to myself, what am I going to do with this stuff? Or what about that, that third grade, back before we gave out participation trophies, that third grade time I actually won something, right? That, that baseball trophy that I, I valued and I carried around like it was gold. Or students, you're going to get some great senior mementos. You're going to get some great gifts you'll hold on to. You get some great wedding gifts you'll hold on to. And they will, like my house, sit in my house for 15 years with a sticker still on them, but I kept them because somebody gave it to me. If you wanted, you have some crystal back here that I'd be glad to share with you. I got more crystal than a crystal shop has crystal. I mean, I got crystal. I got every shape and size you can imagine. I don't know what to do with it. I just use good old paper plates. You know what I mean? I'm just a paper plate kind of guy. What am I trying to say? Folks, we, we, we major on things that in the end is not going to matter. We think our kids want to be happy in this one particular moment. So we watch this. Don't miss this. We compromise just a little. We sacrifice just a little because we want our kids to not be left out. We want our kids to be happy. We want our kids to to fit in. And there's nothing wrong with that on the surface. But the problem comes when we prioritize the wrong thing and we teach our kids that God is not first in everything. That God is not to be designed a part of every part of our lives. We lose focus from our human perspective. We can't help it. And this is a great time, seniors, moms and dads. You had all these, think about it. 936 weeks ago, your little precious angel that sits before you was born. And back then you had all these dreams. Scholarships for college. We want our kids to be successful, to be the best ball player, cheerleader, dance, or band member, scholar, marry the right person, live in the right neighborhood, have the right friends. And all that, while that is all good and important, it is not the top priority and focus of our lives. It should not be. What should be is making certain that our kids know and love Jesus 
and know and love his church and are committed to the church to be a part of the church because the church is God's vehicle for redemption. It is the only hope for a lost and dying world, dear friends. It is it. There is no other organization. There is no other agency. It is not the Red Cross. It is not the Salvation Army. It is not, and I love Christian services. It's not Christian services. It's not Hope Clinic. All these are important arms, but they are not the church. The church alone has the call of God to leave a legacy and to help moms and dads, help their kids know that they have to consider the end. Even when the end seems far away and they're in tears saying, why, why, why? We have to help them see and understand that it's not about that trophy or that ring or that this or that that or that plaque or whatever it may be, whatever you want to call it. That all that in the end will fade away. Most of us don't know where our trophies are from elementary age, middle school, and high school. Maybe you do, and that's awesome if you do. I don't know where mine are. I didn't have many probably, so I didn't have many to store up. You have to consider the end, but here's the challenge. Our culture is telling you, don't worry about the end. It'll all work out. In the end, it'll all work out. It's all fine. Quit getting so stressed. Just let your kid go along with everybody else and it'll be fine. But the reality is, guess what? It won't happen that way. The command, the Shema, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength was to help keep perspective and help our children keep the end in mind. It was a guide because we can get off kilter, lose our focus. Our job as parents is to constantly guide them back to what is the core and the most important. And by the way, moms, dad, let me let a little pressure off of you because we feel that pressure. I don't know if you do. I I hope you feel that pressure a little bit. But here's the deal. You're not called to be God to to your kids. We're about to enter those middle school years. I'm so excited. As a youth minister... Right? As a youth minister, I did it for 13 years before I ever had any kids. Man, I gave some of the greatest advice to parents. I'm telling you, great advice. And I told those parents when I gave it to them, I said, I hope you'll remind me of these wonderful nuggets of truth I'm sharing with you that you'll come back and share with me. I really considered, no lie, because of my 13 years of seeing broken, hurting teenagers. I really, really consider I don't want to have kids and bring them into the world in which I was living at that time, not knowing where we'd be 15 years later. I went to an associate pastor on our staff, and he was older than I was, had a teenager in the youth groups, junior, senior high school. Lewis Boyd's his name, passed away from cancer about seven or eight years ago. And I said, I don't know if I want to have kids. I'm being completely realistic and honest. I don't know if I want to have kids. And his statement, I can still hear it in my mind. I still hear it. He said, if people like you don't have kids and they're not taught to know the Lord and the ways of the Lord and to follow the Lord, where is our culture going to be? Now, there's some things I'm not looking forward to middle school. There are things I'm very excited about middle school. Son's going to go to go infuse this summer and experience Jesus in a fresh way and serve others and begin to broaden his perspective and his eyes. Now I'm not excited about all the emotional stuff and puberty and all that great stuff. I don't want to do any of that stuff. <laughs> and I got a long time to endure it. Because if you're a guest today, I got a 12-year-old and a 3-year-old. And the bottom one is a girl. (laughs) Y'all can let that roll. Let's let that roll a minute. See, parents, doesn't seem so bad now that you got a senior graduating, does it? You've survived. They're alive and so are you and you're not in jail. Congratulations, right? Isn't that true? Right? Let's be real. Some of us want to be all high and pious in here like we've never had those moments. But the reality is you have. I haven't, I haven't got a video camera in your house, but I know because you're human and have blood and a heartbeat, you've had those moments. And you sit there not smiling, act like, I can't believe you're saying that in church. It's just the truth. 
here's the, here's the, here's the reality. Are we going to admit that and what are we going to do about it? How do we walk through it, right? Well, I got real far. Point number one. Isn't that good? <laughs> this may turn into a series the whole month of May. <laughs> you, you know what, though? Here, here's what I do know. Some of you have gotten, I've, it's amazing. When I talk about family and parenting, I get more comments. When I do marriage series and parenting series, I get more comments and people listen more. Somebody told me this week, I listen to my sermon twice. I said, man, you must have really been desperate <laughs> if you listen to my sermon twice. I wouldn't listen to it one time, much less twice. Why? Because all of us innately want to know, how in the world do I do this? I really want my kids to know and love Jesus. And we feel that pressure and that weight and that responsibility, which we have, but ultimately guess whose responsibility it is? It's their creator who made them in his image. God says, this again from Reggie Joyner who wrote this orange strategy, said this one day in his office, it seemed as God said this to him. I'm not trying to make your kids happy. I want them to really live. In the middle of their pain, I can be a better friend than anyone, even you. I am the only one who can really love them unconditionally, forgive them forever, and be a perfect father. So maybe, mom and dad, you just need to trust me enough so they can see me. Besides, with all of your issues, we have a moms and dads. I think it's probably better for them to trust me more than they trust you. Isn't it more important for them to love me more than they love you? I can heal their hearts. You can't. I can give them eternal life. You can't. I am God. And you're not. So take a little pressure off of yourself, moms and dads. They have a creator, a heavenly father who loves them and created them and wants to see them know and follow him. But how they see that is in me and in you. Before I close, I want to set the stage where we're going to go the next however many Sundays it takes me to get through. And I want to make this really, really, really practical. And here's what I want you to know. I'm going to put some tools in your hands, okay? And I'm going to tell you about these cues because I spent a lot of time, and Chris did too, of, of like being technologically really, really good because I'm not. But there's a way you can do this, all right? Oh, I got to connect to you, don't I? Man, I, I, I learned more stuff. Um, they're connected. Let's see if this is going to happen. All right, so what I want you to do, our kids and our preschoolers are using this orange curriculum, Right? Shows, can, there it is right there. Look at there. All right. There is an app right here called the Parent Q app, right? Okay. And what this does is helps you think about the 936 marbles. Because some of you, I, I saw your faces last week. You're going, I ain't buying no 936 marbles. I got, you talk about all that stuff I got, so now I'm going to add another jar of marbles per child? No way. I felt the same way you did. Although I'm going to keep these because it's a great reminder. So there's an app. There's an app. Of course, we all know the statement is an app for everything, right? We're going to make it deliverable to you. There's two things I want you to know. They're on your back of your outline, okay? There's the Parent Q app. You can put each child in there. So William has 325 weeks to graduation. Matthew has 429 weeks to graduation. <laughs> and Emma has 763. So, sorry. Apologize. Oh, I'm just going to be 60 when that happens. All right. Anyway, so... <sighs> yes. It's good just to live these moments out loud, isn't it, dear? Don't you feel better? <clears throat> My wife's going to be young. She's just going to be 55. So, but underneath this, right, okay, so underneath this, it gives things that goes with all these things I'm going to talk about. Something to remember in a scripture that she's learning on Sunday mornings. So let me give my pitch real quickly. Moms and dads, you can't do this job on your own. There are 60 hours that we can invest in your child, and we're doing that and giving you them the tools to do it at home. Right? A verse that you're going to repeat. Right? There's things you can do. Your month, every day your child wakes up. This is going to sound very repetitive to you, but children learn through repetition. 
So every morning this month, I need one to wake up at least this week. This is all about the week. It's going to be a great day because God's got it. I wanted to know that, this phrase this week. So I'm going to tell it to her seven times, right? There's a phase thing we'll talk about a little bit later about where she is. Maybe it's the time to introduce a try. So we'll give you some really things. Seven to 63 weeks, right? And it goes through each child this way, right? Tells me different things for Matthew, right? They're talking about determination is their character trait they're learning this month, right? Boys and girls, determination, right? So lest you think, kiddos, you're not going to pay attention. Mom and dad are going to know what you're learning. So they're going to be asking you. So you can't give this answer. What'd you learn? Jesus. (laughs) That won't work, right? What's your Bible story about? God, that won't work, okay? Moms and dads are going to know two reasons, right? So we've got the parent key right here, okay? It helps you roll through that. You can download that app. It's simple. I promise you, if I can do it, I promise you, you can do it. I guarantee it, all right? Here's the other thing that you can go to. It's a website. It's called studio252.tv. How many of you have seen, that is not coming out from underneath that. How many of you have ever seen what we call a God time or a parent cue? How many of you have seen this before? Raise your hand. You've seen these before, okay? How many of you, that's it? That's all. Oh, seriously, I need everybody to raise your hand if you've ever seen one of these before. Okay, all right, good. How many of you this never made it home past Sunday school and made it somewhere in the car or in the toilet or the dog's mouth or the garbage can or on the floor of the church? We find many of these. They don't make them home, do they, right? So I have a solution because I have one of those the last three weeks. Hey, where's your God time? Uh, I think mama got it. I hope mama got it. I don't want to have responsibility for anything, so I don't have it. I don't know where it is. I use her toilet paper. I don't know what it is, right? I don't know what, right? Okay. So here's here's what I want you to see. On this website, right here, I'm going to show you how to use it. It's on your mobile phone, okay? So some of you, we we learn, most of us don't use a computer anymore. We use an iPad or that kind of Android device or your phone, right? We know this by how you read our emails. 90% of you, when you check your email, you check it on your phone for the 12 of you that actually check the email. So, so you click over on this little thing over here. All, all these mobile websites will have this little, this little bars over here. It's a menu, okay? You click parents over here, right? So you can click parents. It's going to take you to, this is really cool. It's going to take you to the God time, okay? So if you don't come home with a paper, which a lot of us don't, then it gives you the God times, okay? And it's going to take you to, you go to parents, okay? Once you get to parents, you go back to the menu again. It says this month's CEUs, Qs, right? Not continuing education credits, but Qs, right? So here's what it gives. And I'm going to talk about these times, so I hope you come back next Sunday. If you're visiting, come back next Sunday. This is going to be worth it, I promise you. If you'll hang in there with me, that promise you it's going to be worth it. Right here it gives you things to do. It gives you drive time, a song to play, meal time, things to discuss. So you literally click this right here, right? You click this, it opens up on your phone and gives you questions to talk about at supper. Right? That old-fashioned thing that a lot of you don't do anymore, sit down together. There's a family, all of you together around the table with no TV. <gasps> Kids are panic mode right now. Oh, my gosh. No phone at the table. We call that a no electronic zone, right? Questions you can ask for the week, right? Scroll back. You've got hang time. Okay, this is the God time thing. Now, I have to be really quick here, and I'll explain it deeper. All right? It, it downloads what's called a zip file. Okay? You're going, what the heck is a zip file? Well, it's too big, so they zip it, right? There's two ways to do that. You can download, unfortunately, another app called iZip, or you can open it in your notes section. It's got a notes on your phone, and it will open up the God Times. It gives you four files. We just just now found this out accidentally. We've given you a God Time from K through 5, but there's actually a God Time for kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, which is awesome because when Matthew is in kindergarten, reading about stuff, and he's giving me this look, this glazed over what are you talking about, right? Because it was too high. So you can find the one that's appropriate for your child once you unzip it that way, and you can find it there, right? Then it gives the bedtime things to walk through as well. All designed around the curriculum, right? And it's not curriculum, it's a strategy. It's an orange strategy, right, that gives you that stuff. Now, I'm going to go into more detail about what each of these pieces are and how this is intentional, and watch this, how this literally lines up with Scripture, This is not just some pie-in-the-sky deal. They literally phrase it around the Shema. When you sit down, when you wake up, when you walk along the path. None of us know how to walk anymore, hardly. When you drive, when you get on a golf cart, when you get on a hoverboard, right? When you walk, when you drive, it means, and when they go to bed. 
These times together are significant. And we're going to talk about how to take the most advantage of those moments and give you the tools and resources you don't have to come up with. Right? So we tried this last week in the car. Okay? Here's what we said. No phones in the car, driving all the way to the ends of the earth, Hattiesburg. <laughs> way over there. And this is what we hear from our children. Oh, my goodness. What are we going to do? We're going to do something old-fashioned. We're going to talk. Talk? I don't want to talk. That's boring. So I'm just giving you, kids, you're going to have to close yours for a minute. So we, Rebecca does what she's good at. She Googles and she finds questions. And so we start asking questions. Every kid likes to answer questions. So now, granted, in, in one of my kids' cases, the answer was the same for every question. Taco Bell, right? Because he loves Taco Bell. What are you going to be when you grow up? You know, we laugh. Work at Taco Bell, so I'm going to have free Taco Bell my whole life, right? That's became the running joke. But we talked about this. All the while, Emma is singing, because her movie player is now turned off, Jingle Bells, over and over and over and over again, right? Jingle Bells, Taco Bell. We, got, we had it all. It was just it was going right there. Are you, are you with me? You know, it's just for 10 or 15 minutes, we're having conversations, and I learned some things about my kids I didn't know. I want to help you, parents. I don't want to just tell you, be a better parent. Be a better parent. You're a terrible parent, right? That helps you a lot, doesn't it? I want to give you tools and resources in your hands to help you intentionally and consistently help your children know and love God more than anything else. Students, we're going to do the same for you. So hang tight. I'm just talking about preschool and children. We've got some resources for students. We're going to roll that as well. This is a process. To help you and us partner together to help our kids love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Are you with me on this? I I, I hope, will you do me a favor? Because sometimes as a preacher, we wonder, have I talked to the back wall (laughs) or have I communicated? Would you drop me a text or an email and say, I'll be here next Sunday. I want to hear more about what you're talking about. I, I want the help. I want the encouragement. You don't have to be a parent yet. You can learn it already on the front side. You'll be glad you learned it early. Grandparents, you can learn. This takes all of us together. Every week, 936. Since we, went, so we left last week, every one of you that have a kid took a marble out. You will not get that week back. But here's the good news. You got a fresh marble this week. What are you going to do with it? So that when you come and sit in this building next Sunday, and you will, I wish I had mind control, and you will, right? I pray that we're birthing a love for you to want to be here. What are you going to be able to say about what you did with that marvel? Will it be the same old, same old? Dragon to church, dragon at the end of the week because I've crowded it with so much stuff. We're going to talk about how to, I'm going to, I promise you, I'm going to give you some so good things for you to look at and help you straight out of scripture to help you as a family not come to Sunday morning and everybody's tongues are hanging out or if you even get here. I want to help you. So I pray you feel that encouragement this morning. Let's pray together.